Welcome at the Louvain House, at the top of the Ola Magna, one of the main buildings here in Louvain-la-Neuve. Here we have an excellent vantage point to contemplate the overarching themes of the course. In this video, we are going to give you a general overview of the content and structure of the whole course. The first chapter, which is available to you now, provides an overview of some preliminary issues. We look into the history of IHL, as well as its relationship to two other branches of international law, namely human rights law and the use ad bellum. In chapter two, we'll examine the sources and subjects of IHL where to find that law, who makes it, and who is bound by it. IHL is a specialized branch of international law. Therefore, the main sources and subjects of IHL are the classical sources and subjects of international law. This means that treaties and customary law are the most important sources, while states, as well as international organizations, are the most important subjects. As the sources and subjects of international law are examined in depth in the University of Louvain MOOC on international law, we'll focus on the special features of IHL in relation to this issue. In particular, this entails an examination of the legal position of armed groups. The inclusion of armed groups in the study of IHL is becoming ever more important because today, classical international armed conflicts between two or more states are relatively rare in comparison to what we call internal or non-international armed conflicts, which are contested by a state and an armed group or between armed groups. In chapter three, we'll consider the scope of application of IHL. IHL only applies in armed conflicts. This obviously raises the question, what is an armed conflict according to IHL? But answering that question is not enough to identify which IHL rules apply. The extent to which those rules apply depends upon whether the armed conflict in question may be qualified as an international armed conflict or non-international armed conflict, or to use abbreviations, whether it may be qualified as a NIAC or a NIAC. This qualification may seem straightforward to you, but in fact, they are both extremely important and very complex. For example, how should we qualify a series of terrorist attacks conducted on the territory of one state by groups based trained are funded by other states. What about the conflict in Syria and Eastern Iraq involving numerous rebel groups, including the so-called Islamic State, the governments of Syria and Iraq, and a number of foreign states? Complex questions like this also arise regarding the geographical and temporal scope of application of IHL. How far IHL applies from the battlefield and how long it applies after the hostilities? We'll try to answer these questions in the course. A third essential question is, what is the content of IHL? What limits does the law place on the conduct of the belligerents in armed conflicts? Generally speaking, as we'll see, IHL is the result of a delicate tension between two major preoccupations. Military necessity on one hand, which means that belligerents must have sufficient freedom to actually fight the war. And on the other hand, humanitarian considerations, which seek to minimize unnecessary suffering. In other words, IHL is the result of an equilibrium between two fundamental principles. The principle of military necessity and the principle of humanity. IHL seeks to achieve this equilibrium by regulating two aspects of warfare. 
The first aspect, which will be addressed in chapter four of this course, concerns the protections of individuals under the control of the enemy. It is often referred to as the Geneva Law, because the major treaties that govern these issues were signed in Geneva. As you will see, the Geneva Law regulates a wide range of issues that arise in armed conflicts, such as the treatment of prisoners of war, medical aid for wounded soldiers, and the detention of civilians. A significant part of the Geneva Law also deals with a particular issue, the occupation of the territory of a state by another state. It is the law of occupation. The law of occupation sets the duties and rights of the occupying power in relation to the occupied population. It is particularly relevant in relation to the occupied Palestinian territories. The second part of IHL, which will be examined in chapter five of this course, concerns the actual conduct of hostilities. When we talk about IHL regulating the conduct of hostilities, what we mean is the rules regarding who or what can be lawfully targeted and which arms or methods of warfare can be used. Can a farmer be killed during the day when it is established that he or she is fighting with an armed group against the government during the night? Can a school full of children be targeted when the commanders of the enemy armed forces are there? Can chemical weapons be used in the hostilities in relation to a prior attack by such a weapon? All those issues and many more are regulated by the part of IHL which deals with the conduct of hostilities and which is classically called the Hague Law. This is because, as we will see, it is mainly derived from treaties adopted in the Hague. Finally, you may also wonder, what are the legal consequences in case of violations of IHL rules? This question will lead us to analyze the mechanism for implementing and enforcing IHL. In chapter six, six of this course, we'll examine those general mechanisms provided by IHL itself, such as the International Committee of the Red Cross, but also the responsibility of states for violations of IHL. Such a responsibility is an issue regulated by the classical international law of state responsibility. In this course, we'll not study the law of state responsibility in detail, as it is covered in depth in the MOOC on international law. Instead, we'll pay particular attention to the aspects that have greatest relevance to IHL. In the final chapter of this course, we'll analyze the issue of individual criminal responsibility. That is, the responsibility of individuals who have committed serious IHL violations, which amount to war crimes. We will analyze the notion of war crimes, as well as the tribunals that are competent to try war criminals.